postmodernism, what next? Firstly, I'd like to thank staff and students at the University of Zhezhov for this invitation to offer another paper at this conference. And I would also like to bring the very best wishes of Robinson College here at the University of Cambridge. Today, I would like to talk just a little bit about modernity, postmodernity, and what comes next. So it will be a very broad brushstroke talk that covers a lot of ground and skates over a lot of nuance. So when I wheel out um, some of the great thinkers and their contribution to the history of thought or histories of thought, trying to place them in their context, outlining why the world has now moved on from their position, it can sound dismissive or underappreciative. And I would just like to emphasise from the outset that each time I mention a thinker today, it's a thinker well and truly worth engaging with, spending time with, trying to hear. Um, because these are heavyweight thinkers of the past whose own contribution uh, to this conversation continues to have its own relevance today. But all I want to do is offer a narrative of the advent of modernity, how modernity has crumbled into postmodernity, and what might fill the vacuum that postmodernity has left. My New Testament tutor in Oxford, Dr. Larry Kreitzer, used to say that the difference between modernity and postmodernity is identifiable in the difference between the mission of the Starship Enterprise in the, in the original cult 60s sci-fi sci -fi episode and Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, which emerged in the late 1980s. The mission statements are noticeably different, subtly but noticeably different. And he says that this is evident of how modernity has moved to postmodernity. And so leaning on that insight, we will see where that lands us uh, in the world post-post-modernity. At the beginning of each episode, the mission statement of the Starship Enterprise was read by none other than William Shatner, otherwise known as Captain Kirk, and you are probably familiar with the words. Space, the final frontier, and on it goes, these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its mission to boldly go where no man has gone before. A great summary of the modern era. And so we're going to look at the modern era from three basic perspectives. Firstly, the myth of progress. This is one key element of modernity, the myth of progress. On and on and on and up and up and up. Our ancestors were stupid, cave-dwelling, knuckle-scraping herd animals. But we, in the modern world, have the capacity to be rational, independent, free-thinking. Uh, it's rooted largely in the philosophy of history um, peddled by the brilliant thinker George Friedrich Hegel. And I wish there was time to go into the cycle of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, a, a notion often attributed to Hegel. But the belief in progress, where gradually each generation we're moving closer to some ideal, some mythological future, some distant utopia that's coming ever nearer as humanity betters itself. Things can only get better. You have to ignore quite a lot on that narrative. You have to position yourself amongst the most privileged elements of the human race. And you have to ignore the question of where the myth of progress has dumped us in the 21st century. Where has progress bought, brought the human race? Where has it brought us ideologically, economically, ecologically? The creative accounting by some thinkers, I think of Hans Rosling off the top of my head, um, I think his book was called Factfulness, uh, a narrative that even today, 
progress continues, everything's getting better, everything's good. And of course, that's always going to appeal to a big readership. It's always going to be attractive to lots of people who are doing well and who are reaping the benefits and who don't want to feel guilty about the fact that things are not getting better for lots of people. These kinds of narratives today tend to evaporate the moment they're exposed to any serious reflection. So that's, that's the first element of modernity, the myth of progress. The second is the, what's sometimes called the expanding circle of the self, the expanding circle of the human self. Um, the expanding circle we can trace back to René Descartes, who many regard as one of the founding fathers of the modern era. It's largely because um, Descartes' famous phrase, I think, therefore I am, captures so much of the spirit of modernity. For Descartes, you cannot know anything for sure. Your life, your history, your relationships, your identity, anything that's important to you, anything and everything that makes you who you are, could just be a dream that you might wake up from any moment. Uh, the entire universe as we know it might just be a fantasy playing out only in your tiny little head. Um, and it could be a demon planted these thoughts there, this artificial world, this artificial history, this myth of who you are. This could, could be some dream supernaturally planted into you 10 minutes ago by some malicious demon. Um, of course, it's a silly picture, but it's possible. We can't know anything for sure. And so Descartes encourages us to doubt everything. Doubt everything you can possibly doubt. Everything. But then, you cannot doubt one thing. One thing you cannot doubt when you're in the process of doubting. You cannot doubt the fact that you are in the process of doubting. Um, and since you are doubting, you are thinking. And because no one else can do your thinking for you, you must, after all, exist. I think, therefore I am. So that means I, in my own private little space, on my own isolated viewing platform, can be sure only of me. My view on the universe becomes central. It's, it's central to everything else. It used to be, um, before modernity, that God was at the centre of everything. In the world of Christendom, it was God who was at the centre. And humanity was an object of God's imagination. God creates human beings. On Descartes' view, when you've got humanity at the centre of everything, suddenly it's God becomes a figment of our imagination. And the moment we stop believing in him, he will just vanish in a puff of incense, like Tinkerbell. Uh, I think, therefore I am. This means that if I want to understand the world as it is, I have to rebuild it around me, around my certainties, about, around what I can know. It puts me with my fine thinking, rational, independent head brain at the centre of life, the universe and everything the expanding circle of the self. And then thirdly, the sovereignty of man. And by man, we mean that element of the human race that really matters, man. And so I, from my solid viewing platform of my male certainty, I can gain a true picture of life, the universe and everything. Whatever else modernity meant, it was the age of the sovereignty of the self, my male self. Man is the measure of all things. Modernity. Man is the crown of the created order. And as we know, the woman in the biblical narrative, the woman comes along second. She's in second place. You know, she's made from the rib of Adam. And yes, you can say, well, uh, that was the Bible. That was a long time before modernity. But... The problem with modernity is that the Bible itself becomes subjected to the interpretive authority of man. And from the perspective of a, a, a biblical scholar and a college chaplain, 
that one particular bizarre modern way of interpreting the biblical text is the one that has stuck and this modern understanding of what the Bible says is treasured not only by Christians who demand that we recognise the authority of scripture but more often I think today that naive mechanical um, and, and blatantly misguided way of reading scripture is treasured by atheists who seek to reject scripture. Um, it's just a bunch of Iron Age myths somebody said to me this week uh, and when somebody says well the scripture is just a bunch of Iron Age myths all I hear is the myth of progress, the assumption that we are superior to our historical ancestors. Now, of course, there are multiple ways of understanding modernity that can vary. Uh, and of course, throughout the modern era, uh, there were those who would challenge the authority of the modern worldview. I think, for instance, of, um, of Soren Kierkegaard, of uh, the Romanticists, um, the existentialists uh, and the entire movement around Friedrich Nietzsche. There were always people there to challenge modernity, but mo modernity, the modern worldview, remained well and truly in place. Then came Star Trek, the next generation. The Starship Enterprise, now captained by Patrick Stewart himself, played, as you probably know, by Professor X. The mission statement had changed slightly. Its mission was now an ongoing mission. You know, you, you don't arrive at certainty. Now we have an ongoing mission to boldly go where no one has gone before. Not no man. We now boldly go where no one has gone before. If modernity was about the sovereignty of the self, postmodernity was an attempt to dethrone that sovereign male human self. And the great theories and stories about life, the universe and everything were revealed as power claims, claims that were made by obnoxious, deluded man, a man who had placed himself at the centre of the universe, on the throne. Postmodernity, that emerged as a force from the late 1960s, I suppose, was the attempt to dethrone him. And I'm just going to outline three basic dimensions of postmodernity. Uh, the first is the notion of relativism. Truth is relative, says the postmodernist. Uh, the desire to congratulate or assure ourselves that we are right, that certain facts are unquestionable, and that our worldview is the natural one, betray an arrogance in the modern mindset. And the relativist reminds us that all of our claims all of our beliefs and our certainties are filtered through our human, time-bound, culture-bound, earth-bound fallibilities. Relativists note that all truths are truth claims. Uh, and who's to decide whether one person's view is more valid than another? There's no overarching great single truth that can be used to measure all these competing truth claims. Um, if I try to scale Mount Olympus to get a God's eye view of the world, if I do ever get to the top of Mount Olympus, I discover that it's the home of many gods with many views and many competing world views. Postmodernity says that the principles, the values, the foundations, the rights, the duties, the narratives, long thought to be eternal, unchanging absolutes, are little more than a modernist dream conjured up to make us feel secure in a violent and godless universe. Whatever we decide to do, whatever is useful for us to believe, whatever is expedient to argue, our appeal to eternal absolute truth comes late in the day. There's a difficulty with um, this model though, the rejection of meta-narratives it's sometimes called. There's a basic response to relativism from the modernist crowd, and that was to say that if truth is relative, then so too is the truth that truth is relative. If I claim that all truth is relative, I'm making an absolute claim, and my theory disappears up its own uh, backside, essentially. 
Anyone that claims truth is relative is making an absolute, universal, unquestionable, factual statement. Uh, but this is not the last word on relativism. Another dimension of relativism came in the form of something called neo-pragmatism. And the pragmatists, the neo-pragmatists, uh, attempted to dethrone the sovereign self by emphasising that the individual's human self is simply the product of an interpretive community. And so it's Stanley Fish is the big name here, uh, has shown that we learn to become who we are only within some kind of context. And we cannot climb out of our context in order to relate to an other. Uh, although there are all kinds of contexts and all kinds of communities, says Stanley Fish, the community that shapes our world and our view of the world is an absolute authority for us because we cannot escape it. So our truth might indeed be theoretically relative to others, and yet within our communities, within the world into which we've been thrown, we just cannot escape. And we can make absolute truth claims without contradiction because the community to which we belong is an absolute authority for us and can and can correct us. The, the difficulty with Fish is that he never says what a community is uh, and claiming that we cannot ever encounter the other because we are so bound by our own communities very quickly descends into an excuse for not bothering to relate to the other, for not bothering to listen well and you collapse into a communal solipsism, a communal form of selfism. Tribalism, I think, is the contemporary word for this. That's where it leads. If you end up saying, well, it's impossible to relate to the other out there, we just close the doors of our minds, of our communities, of our countries. The third dimension of postmodernity is deconstruction. The French philosopher Jacques Derrida uh, built a system of deconstruction in an attempt to displace the sovereignty of the human self. He calls for a radical uncertainty, an ongoing acceptance that our knowledge of anything is deeply provisional, deeply unstable, in a perpetual state of potential collapse. Like Sartre, uh, Derrida was painfully aware of the disturbance that the presence of the other can bring and regarded the entire history of Western philosophy as an exercise in averting our gaze from the disturbing otherness of the other. And in his later writings, he wrote at length about a messiah, arguing that we must always be perpetually open, always looking for this great other to break into our experience in the present. The trouble with, with that later Derrida was that he ended up becoming so prescriptive about who that messiah was and how that messiah could behave, it ends up projecting our own domesticated comforts and assumptions and worldviews and certainties, projecting those onto the other, whilst all the time deluding ourselves with the possibility that we are open, open-minded, able to be free-thinking and ready for the other to break into our experience. Postmodernity. Again, that's not the only way of describing postmodernity. There are multiple tracks in and out of this uh, morass, but I think it's a legitimate way. And it goes some way to explaining why postmodernity has fallen from favour um, in the last 10, 20 years. And so the question uh, I'd like to address is what might come next? So we've spoken about modernity, we've spoken about post-modernity. Now I'd like to speak about phusis and how we relate to the other. The, the question of how the self relates to the other continues to pervade a lot of discourse that is deemed postmodern, And the nature of lots of this discourse uh, can be summarised in the psychological questionnaire that presents the following question. Please circle the picture below which best describes your relationship. There is an obvious problem with this way of visualising the relationship between the self and the other, which was highlighted for me by Professor Louise Wessling, 
uh, in which she illustrates how such a way of relating can be dangerous. Taking the example of the otherness in animals, Professor Westling cited the case of Sue Savage uh, Rumbau, who, whose relationship with a bonobo um, in seeking to identify too closely with this bonobo called Kanzi, who she'd been working with. Her relationship with that bonobo may have become potentially destructive. Uh, Kanzi, the bonobo, has an otherness that cannot be violated. And Professor Wesling goes on to speak about an otherness that has to be preserved and warns that you just can't have it. How then are we to articulate, on the one hand, the necessity of relating well to the other, and on the other hand, the limits of that relationship, the fact that there are some, some beings that are so other that we cannot relate to them in the way that we might relate to another human, for instance. And my struggle in grappling with this question seems to have revealed a gaping hole either in my reading or in the habits of discourse on this topic, or perhaps in our modern intellectual tradition as a whole. Most obviously, our default language for describing our sense of self remains largely self-centred. Uh, that is, we imagine um, self in relation to the other, where we still tend to begin from ourself. That is, with a me-centred view of the world, the anthropocentric, human-centred view of the world. This is modernity, if you remember, modernity in its essence. The rational Cartesian me, the me produced by René Descartes, perched on an isolated viewing platform somewhere outside the world to which I relate to the levels of otherness it represents. With the self-centred, me-centred world can be included the familiar environment of our context, our family, our community, our nation, and perhaps our species. Us at the centre, them out there. I mean, we're seeing this at the moment in the international refugee crisis, which is currently being played out, of course, on the doorstep of Poland and with tragic consequences. I, I don't wish to question the usefulness or even the legitimacy of the relational framework uh, encapsulated in that questionnaire, especially when it's understood alongside other ways of learning how we relate to the other. The intention uh, of, of all I have left to say is just to highlight the limitations of self-centred way of understanding the human self and to explore the possibility of alternatives. So the language of nature. I'm not sure if I learned this from Martin Heidegger, the uh, German philosopher of the 20th century, um, or from Dr. Patricia Austin at Zhezhev. Certainly for Heidegger, yeah. when the Greek notion of phusis was transposed into the Latin notion of nature, much was lost, most notably the dynamism uh, of phusis, the active dynamic, living nature of it. When it becomes nature, it seems to turn into a, an object, a noun, something static, something that humans can control, that humans are not necessarily a part of. Phusis refers not only to the particular things that we might see around us, but to the process by which these things come into being. Uh, for Heidegger, all things uh, in Fusis are in a condition of being moved, not only from A to B, but from seed to bud, for instance. There's, there's some active dynamic of life, of bringing forth in Heidegger's language. And is there a sense in which all forms of life uh, have this Fusis in common? Uh, an inner dynamic spirit, a growth, a process, a process underway in me, a process underway in those things around me. One of the ways of looking at this is with a picture. I think the first person to use this tree um, image was Aristotle, but certainly it is the illustration that appears in Darwin's Origin of Species, uh, the notion of a tree of life. And on pictures like this, we might regard each of the beings, 
on that picture as a manifestation of phusis represented by all these different branches. And the commonality that we might find with the other is not then to be found by overlapping circles of the psychological questionnaire, but by seeking to trace both our situatedness and that of the other on those fusic branches by identifying, so far as it's possible, the point at which I and the other diverge is to identify the limits of our capacity to identify with the other. From our place on the branch, the presence of the other, um, the presence of other beings, is never exhausted by our relationship to them. The tree, the flower, the bonobo, the friend, the lover, are always something more than our conception of them. And yet, our conscious attunement to the phusis of the other is likely to be what enables any potential convergence with them. Uh, attention to phusis itself offers a means of commonality with the other that helps to prevent both the subjugation of the other to our schemes and the subjugation of ourself to the other. And it might also provide us with a means of legitimising modernity's obsession with meaning. Um, I realise that's a whole other question, but meaning, strictly speaking, is an active verb. We are meaning. Um, commonly it's understood as some static noun. We have meaning. We want our lives to have meaning. I have no idea what that means. Um, meaning, however, might legitimately be regarded as an active flow um, that comes through us, through our relating from self to other. Meaning simply means to carry something. What are we carrying? Are we the bearers of phusis? How does that help us to relate to the other? This is a, a question that's being explored increasingly by people working in areas of network intelligence, for instance. Uh, there's a magnificent 10-minute uh, video summarising how network intelligences might work. And one of the things it emphasises is the inadequacy of the tree illustration I've just related to you. Because it points out that all those branches of the tree are not just separated from each other on their branches, but are mutually bound with one another um, at, a, at a micro level that we tend not to be aware of. Um, cod in the sea is mutually dependent on other species, interacts with a hundred other species. Uh, our, our mutual dependency at the personal level, at the species level, uh, is it alludes to a way of thinking that has not yet saturated some of the theories on how we engage with literature and how we interpret texts. So where does that land us in the post-postmodern world? Uh, perhaps we need a new Star Trek adventure where we no longer boldly go where no man has gone before, nor do we boldly go where no one has gone before, because there is no such thing as one, no such thing as the individual isolated free thinker, no such thing as an isolated free thinking self-made automaton. We are persons in relationship, persons in networks of thought, action, community, uh, our rootedness, our mutual rootedness with other humans and with the living world as a whole is something that could helpfully be brought more closely into the world of literary studies and biblical interpretation. In Hebrew scripture, Adam was well and truly rooted in his environment um, and fundamentally in relationship with other species and other people. And it's the same in the New Testament. Um, where different gifts manifest themselves differently in different people. Uh, a world of difference between uniformity and unity, which requires diversity. The Greeks had a word for people who wanted to isolate themselves from one another, who wanted to keep themselves separate, who did not want to engage uh, responsibly in the city-state. These people were called idiotes in Greek. And uh, idiotes in Greek, you might be able to guess how that translates into modern English. All that to say that we probably don't need to go off 
seeking to discover strange new life on other galaxies and other planets, visiting Mars, visiting the Moon and so on. There is often a gigantically underappreciated, unnoticed, fusic life throbbing under our noses, a whole universe under our noses that is unexplored, a whole vast unexplored territory on our doorstep, which means that space is probably not the final frontier.